無限転身の名にかけて優しくマックに沈めてあげる Hey, what are you looking at? Just kidding. You're gonna see a lot more of that today because we're going to be talking about sexualization in fighting games. Don't worry, we're not here for some puritanical screeching, but it's not a goon session either. Instead, we're putting the TNA under a microscope to see how they became a part of the fighting game DNA and what sort of connotations it has for the genre and its enjoyers. If you've been into video games for any time at all, the topic of over-sexualized characters is one that you've seen re-emerge time and time again. It's cyclical discourse that keeps coming back without anyone finding a common ground. Instead, people just label the other side as either virgins or prudes and move on to discuss other pressing matters like the mystery of inflation defying buck 50 Costco hot dogs. Much like the topic of violence in video games, it all goes back more than a few decades. But for sexualization, it probably peaked around 10 years ago when Anita Sarkeesian released part one in her video series titled Tropes vs. Women in Video Games. Putting aside some of the questionable criticisms presented there, this series had a massive impact on both the industry and community, since it made a lot of people confront the topic of sexism and objectification in video games. And naturally, fighting games weren't spared from being dragged into this eternal debate. In fact, one of the Tropes vs. Women videos even had a big focus on Dead or Alive and Tekken, judging both of the titles for rewarding players with especially skimpy outfits for buying DLCs, or ordering the game from specific store chains. They even had Anna give you a sultry reminder to pick the game up from GameStop. This is Anna Williams, calling in on behalf of GameStop with some juicy news. Turns out your copy of Tekken Tag Tournament 2 is ready for pickup. The topic didn't quite catch on the way it did with other genres, but you could already see the seeds growing in the Western community with the release of MK9. Every female character in that game had mandatory bolt-ons and more than generous cleavage to show them off. It was so in your face about fan service that even despite MK's history of ultraviolence and tacky outfits, it made people ask themselves if this might just be too much. For NRS, the answer was definitely yes. When MKX came out in 2015 and adjusted character outfits and their proportions to be much more modest, this shit flinging truly kicked into gear. And when we're talking about the biggest fighting game franchise in the world, it means that the discourse will inevitably spill into other games. But perhaps that wasn't necessary, because in the same year, we had a controversy that orbited around our Mika's ass. If you don't recall, fans accused Capcom of censoring the game after the camera angle of her super animation was adjusted to hide the butt slap. Ono himself even had to comment that they are aiming for a teen game and didn't want to show content that people might not find acceptable. That could have been the end of it, but the Evo of 2016 really helped to shine a spotlight on the cheeks in question when the tournament was streamed on ESPN. Mika's default outfit was simply too hot to handle for the sports channel, so Fudo was requested to switch to a different outfit after the first game. You can imagine that the community wasn't too pleased when they found out about this. It felt like a weird attempt to cover up something normal, something that the community has been more than used to. Who could have imagined that only a few years later, EVO would be doing this of their own accord? During EVO Japan 2019, Dead or Alive 6 had a special exhibition between top players, followed by an ad slash showcase of the game. And let's just say that it was very characteristic for the franchise. They had two gravure models, Saki Yoshida and Yuka Kuromochi, show up on stage and, uh, I mean, you can see on the screen what happened next. This was followed up by a showcase of some in-game features, which in no small part focused on the ability to pause the game and use the free camera, which allowed players to take in the brutal combat, high-impact martial arts, and acrobatic finesse of grappling in its full glory. This titillating display made EVO showrunners tense up, which led to an abrupt and end of the stream and apology of, at the time, the face of EVO, Mr. Wizard, who said the following. The DOA ad that aired on our stream does not reflect the core values of EVO or the FGC. We ended the stream temporarily to protect the integrity of our brand. We sincerely apologize to our fans. But there was no need for an apology. People didn't mind watching a fighting game developer showcase their fighting game at a fighting game event. The implication that it had to be stopped because of FGC's core values was so far from the truth that it was memed and criticized to death. Ironically enough, just a year later, Mr. Wizard would leave his post and the community for exactly the kind of despicable bullshit that does go against the core values of not just the FGC, but any normal person. 
you might be seeing a pattern here. For the most part, whenever someone tried to censor or criticize fighting games for how they depict the female characters, it was almost universally met with pushback, at least when it's done from the outside. Within the communities, these discussions did get more common, which is especially evident with Tekken and Mortal Kombat. While Tekken fans mostly argue whether women should be allowed to age and have more than one body type, Mortal Kombat is a full-on minefield, likely thanks to the series history we mentioned before. But when we talk about fighting games as a whole, is there really a problem there? Is it fair for some people to complain about it? The answer is complicated, and that's why it's something that's worth talking about, since there are many factors to consider here. First and foremost, it's safe to say that yes, fighting games are overtly sexualized, but that's not a bad thing in and of itself. It's like saying that shooters are violent, at least on average. Soldier of Fortune, Doom, Red Dead, Wolfenstein, there's no shortage of games where you can casually blow someone's head off more often than you blink. Those games are violent, and yet none of them get into hot water the same way Manhunt, Harvester, or Modern Warfare 2 did. Blowing up demons and Nazis is a jolly good time that anyone can get behind, but shooting up an airport full of innocent people or getting rewarded for being exceptionally cruel is an entirely different story. Sexualization works much in the same way. It starts at nothing and then slowly rises. At the lower levels, we run into the current Mortal Kombat with its very reserved approach to character designs that is mildly and completely inoffensive to everyone but the most scrupulous critics. At the middle to high points, we get games like Tekken and Street Fighter. Despite obviously leaning into the fan service, it's mild enough that most people would never really question it, even though that won't stop us from squinting our eyes a bit when someone says that they're only playing Yuri or Eliza because they like the gameplay. Then finally, we reach the upper end of the scale. This is where you'll find Dead or Alive, Rumble Roses, and SNK Heroines. At this point, it becomes impossible to ignore that sex appeal is meant to be the main selling point. Do these games have good gameplay? I think Dead or Alive does. I'm not sure about the others, but how would I ever convince someone outside of the FGC that this is that this is actually a complex and engaging fighting game with an interesting hold system that redefines the dynamic of attack and defense? <laughs> I, I I only play for the fighting. I, I appreciate the expansive multi-tier environments and the 16 characters with the, the pixel shading bump mapping. I honestly feel bad for people who only care about DOA for its gameplay, because the majority of people, even in the FGC, will forever carry the claim of a horny game for horny people. But if sexualization can have such adverse effects, why do it? Well, because typically positives outweigh the negatives. Sex sells. It doesn't matter who you are or what you believe in, everyone prefers looking at characters that they can find appealing or feel attracted to. Both men and women want to have characters that they can get attached to, someone who could become their virtual avatar. This doesn't require sexualization, but the two typically go hand in hand, and it can even be harmful to try and restrict it in some way. What might seem like an over-the-top fan service to one person could be empowering to women who want to express themselves by playing an alluring character like Ivy, Anna, or Bayonetta. Now it's time to be moved. In the same vein, while some guys might enjoy the power fantasy of playing as a gruff and muscular half-naked swordsman, the same character might just end up appealing to women who enjoy such character archetypes, and they're more common than you think. After all, characters like Mitsurugi, Victor, Huarang, or Raphael are not far off from men that you'd find in Otomi games, which are visual novels that primarily target a female audience. This gets us to the final question. If this is not an issue for us as players, and in fact, it's something that we typically gravitate towards, consciously or not, then who would have any sort of issue with it? The more I thought about it, the more I started to realize that there's not one definitive group to point fingers at. Sure, there are some individuals and activists who wish to see more diversity, representation, and perhaps push some standards of how hot a character is allowed to be, but I feel like trying to focus on them will just lead to missing a bigger picture, and that picture is painted by money and cultural standards. Publishers aren't funding games out of the goodness of their heart. They want to make money. And to make money, you want your product to appeal to the widest audience possible. In terms of gameplay, this means having as few barriers of entry as possible. That's how we get features like modern controls in Street Fighter VI, simplified Gatlings in Strive, or auto combos in King of Fighters. But in terms of overall game and character design, it means that you don't want to make a game that would go against the cultural norms of your audience and nothing, absolutely nothing, demonstrates this better than the black and white contrast between the USA and Japan. 
The USA is pretty chill with depictions of hundreds of different ways to destroy a human body, and Mortal Kombat is a fantastic example of it. Gutting, burning, slicing, or crushing a human body is a staple of the series. Fatalities only get more gruesome, shocking, and vile in each new title, but when it comes to character designs, keep it reserved, keep it classy, we have a refined establishment here. Meanwhile, Japan is the complete opposite. It's not at all uncommon to find rather exposed character designs or sexual themes in games that are rated for teens, but violent titles like Doom get the maximum 18 plus rating from CERO, and Mortal Kombat went from having recolored blood to being outright banned. These cultural differences become even more apparent when entertainment from both countries gets censored during the localization process to comply with cultural norms. The new Yakuza game are even made in tandem with localization teams so that developers can get their input on what's acceptable while still making the game. Stuff like this usually drives the fans mad and it's entirely justified. But hate it or not, these cultural norms didn't come out of thin air and while localizations cutting up the original work is sad, it's ultimately the driving factor behind the constant arguments about the topic of sexualization in fighting games. In a perfect world, we would likely get localizations that change as little as possible and allow the audience to vote with their wallet instead of arguing between each other about whether or not these changes are justified. To sum things up, fighting games are sexualized, but that's what players want. Hell, DOA 6 might be dead, but the extreme spinoff, which is focused entirely on fan service, is averaging more daily players than any fighting game that isn't the newest Tekken or Street Fighter. Even when people do complain about it, it usually comes from the fact that their own cultural code is not compatible with that of the developers. And yet, I wouldn't want to dismiss any and all criticism here. Everyone has a right to an opinion, and all of us usually have something to say even about our favorite games. Instead of saying, this game is not for you, I'd rather encourage people to voice their thoughts and then the developer decide how valid it is. That's the same reason why we never delete negative comments, even though some of them are extremely hostile, never lock our comment section, and if we could, we would be fine with displaying the dislikes too. Everyone should be allowed to express themselves. Personally, I also think that developers can hit a middle ground between wide appeal and sex appeal. For starters, even the most raunchy designs can be more refined. For example, we mentioned Bayonetta before, and despite almost being a poster child for sexualization, it's a tasteful design made by a woman. Marie Shimazaki, who also worked on Soul Calibur in the past. The new Lily design is probably the best one she's ever had while still accentuating her features and once again, made by Lady Jasmine Darnell, a fantastic artist who can depict eroticism with a sense of elegance. Those who are into men also deserve a piece of the pie. They might only be a small percentage of the audience, but they are still a part of it. We mentioned Soul Calibur a lot here, and that's a perfect example of a fighting game that has cool male characters while also making them look very attractive. And no, we're not talking about Valdo. That guy is just damn creepy to everybody. If there's a little something for everybody, I can't imagine too many people complaining about it. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. You have no idea how much we value that. In fact, if you are here and you want to leave a comment, add any emoji you like to the end of it and let's see how many people only comment after they actually finish the video. And of course, if you like the video, drop a like or subscribe to the channel. Just click all the good stuff, keep your APM up. If you dislike the video, then thumbs down is cool too and we always welcome your feedback. Let's hope the comments aren't a shitstorm and we'll see you in the next one.